I suppose I would understand it as a really sort of a, a catch-all uh, expression for you know a, a huge range of of, of interventions uh, essentially that that are attempting to shape the um, the character, the moral fiber, you know, of of students, and so you know that can range from um, something, you know, really intense and targeted, like a me a mentoring program that pairs a, a an instructor, you know, or a, a, a tutor with a with one student, you know, where they they sort of go through life together and share meals and conversation and invest very heavily in each other's lives, um, and and on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have have uh, shorter, um, uh, highly scalable, uh, but, but less impactful interventions like uh, lectures delivered on online, you know, or, or, or content that you just access uh, and, then, and then passively read and then, and then go out and try to, to implement in your own life. And, and, and in between, there's a huge range of possibilities for combining those, uh, you know, those, those, those two sort of formats, you know, sort of talking at students and just trying to, to convey information to them, to, you know, sort of investing in a, in a deep way in, in, in their lives. Uh, and so character education, you know, sort of, uh, uh, there's, there's an enormous range of, of possible um, uh, uh, projects or interventions that sort of combine those elements and, and uh, um, everything in between, yeah. Yeah, so this is a, it's a question that's on, on uh, many people's minds, both, both in this group and, 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 and out of it. And, you know, I think that the, the, more, of a, of, the more of a person that you can engage, um, the better your chances of, of, of shaping his or her character. You know, and so, so we're, uh, we aren't just disembodied intellects, you know, we, we are... Uh, we're, we're embodied souls with, with uh, um, habits and with desires, you know, we, we, we're embedded in, in, in networks of relationships, you know, so, so the more of a person's life that, that, that uh, a university can, can affect, um, the better the shot of changing a person's character is. And so, you know, of course, uh, um, the kind of classical model of a university where the student lives on campus often, you know, in close fellowship with their, with their, with their professors or tutors, um, provide sort of the most immersive version of that of that uh, approach to shaping shaping character. Um, you know, I think online universities, which are which are obviously brand new in terms of the history of education, and we're still all trying to come to grips with with the possibilities that they offer. Um, online universities offer a different a different kind of um, a possibility possibility for a different kind of immersion because so much of our lives are now connected you know to the to the internet we all carry around uh, most of us anyway carry around internet connected smartphones everywhere with us you know and so I think that that one one as yet I think largely unexplored possibility for for character education are uh, interventions that are delivered uh, through digital platforms that you know are are uh, uh, connecting with with users on a on a regular on a regular basis, you know, on an hourly basis, even, you know, that 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 it's it's possible. And there are apps that already exist, I think, which which do this in some ways for for some aspects of psychological well-being. You know, apps which which offer kind of um, regular nudges, so to speak. You know, reminders to be grateful, reminders to. Um, Reminders to pause and meditate, or for, for religious believers to pray, you know. And I think that there are there are a lot of possibilities uh, created by these 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 devices, which which are as yet unexplored. But I'm I'm interested to see what what comes of them. I don't think so, actually. And this is interesting. It's an interesting question, you know, whether whether the teacher's primary job is to is to model is to be a sort of an exemplary version of the virtues that he hopes to, to inculcate in his students. You know, and I think in a way this place is a, uh, this place of, if that's true, it places a very heavy burden on, on teachers, you know, in a way. I mean, professors generally, uh, uh, their, their professional responsibility is teaching. You know, they're hired because they're experts in, in, in Spanish literature or in theology or philosophy. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the, the most, the, the most, uh, impactful uh, way in which, which teachers in the course of their, of, of discharging their duties as teachers, you know, the way, most impactful way they can shape students' lives, I think, um, 
is really by by uh, pointing them to pointing their students to uh, exemplars that they themselves aspire to you know and so so uh, there's a there's a marvelous poem one of one of the um, uh, uh, one of Rilke's uh, poems is, is about the the the, the headless torso of Apollo, which, which uh, stands in the, in the, the Vatican museums. And, and the poem concludes, it's about his experience of witnessing this sculpture. That's an ancient Roman uh, uh, sculpture. And uh, the poem ends with the line, uh, you must change your life. Du musst dein Leben anderen. You know, and I think that, that, that in a way is, the, is, the, is, is, it's a profoundly important part of the teaching experience, you know, to present, uh, to present students with, um, whether it's a great work of literature, a great work of art, a great work of philosophy, and, and say, you know, this, this offers a vision of what your life ought to be like, what your life could be like. Um, and and uh, it's not what my life is, is like, or not perfectly, but I'd like my life to be like this too. And, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's be in this together, this project, you know, of, of pursuing wisdom. Um, so, you know, the, the philosopher, this goes, uh, goes back to, to uh, Plato, you know, famously um, described himself, or, or maybe even Socrates, described himself as, as a philosopher, which means that he was a lover of wisdom. Socrates never claimed to be wise himself, you know, um, but he loved, he loved wisdom and he pursued it and he brought others alongside him to pursue it with him. And I think that that, you know, is really the, the um, at its best, that's what the teaching profession is, you know, bringing others alongside you to pursue this common love. So on the one hand, I think it's very important to recognize the, the limits, you know, of, of, uh, what you can achieve in, in character education through through the liberal arts, um, and I say this as a as a humanist, you know, who's totally committed to to uh, to introducing students, you know, to, to works of great works of philosophy and theology and literature. But you know, it's it's a it is an interesting fact about us that that um, we are entirely capable of of, of absorbing and and admiring. Uh, uh, great works of great works of of, of, of literature or philosophy, um, without, in any obvious way, being being transformed by them. Um, every every Nazi commandant and general, you know, had had a first rate classical education in the in Germany's you know gymnasia. Uh, just as obviously an extreme example, but uh, I think it, it does it does in fact generalize. You know, it's not hard to find uh, deeply cultured. But deeply immoral people, you know, and so I think that, that we need to be clear-sighted about the limits of, of of just setting Homer, you know, or or Dante or Dostoevsky or whatever in front of in in, in, in front of students. Uh, it's not necessarily going to going to uh, elevate their 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 whole character, you know. Uh, uh, it it might it'll make them smarter, you know. It'll make them better. It'll uh, it it might make them more cultured. Uh, uh, so I think that we need a more modest goal, I suppose, really, for what, uh, what that kind of reading achieves. And, and uh, um, the way I would put it, I, 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 I alluded to this in a way in my, one of my earlier responses, but the way I would put it, you know, again, is in terms of, of offering a vision of what, what a life could be like. You know, I think that, that there, there's a, there is a, a broadening of, of one's horizons, you know, which is made possible by, by uh, by reading uh, great works of literature, especially great works from from the, the past, uh, uh, which are, you know, reading reading a, a work written two thousand years ago is, is uh, it's it's a, it's a lot like going on a trip to a foreign country. You know, uh, you, you you become you're suddenly aware of of whole possibilities for what a life might look like. You know, which you've never considered before, um, and. Uh, Literature from the future would do just as well, of course. You know, for, for achieving that result, it's just hard to hard to get your hands on. You know, so we, we read we read books uh, written by written by people long dead, uh, and you know, I think that that's that's a um, that's an enormously powerful aspect of, of literature. Its ability to sort of open your eyes to what your life could be like, uh, and to offer a kind of vision for 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 what you could aspire to. Um, 
the fact that you encounter the vision doesn't necessarily mean that it will transform you, but it at least gives you the possibility. You know, it, 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 uh, it, it, makes you ask, it makes you ask the question, you know, why am I not like this? Uh, you know, why, why, why don't I, uh, why don't I embody Aristotle's conception of the magnanimous man, you know, for instance, and this, now this is a part of my life, I have to think about that, you know, if I hadn't read Aristotle, I wouldn't have to think about it, and so I think that, that it does make a difference, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it can be a profound source of change, catalyst to change, um, if other conditions are met, but on its own, it doesn't, I don't, I don't think it delivers transformation just on its own. Many virtues are, are, are needed for academic life, of course, and, and, and uh, if we, if we, if Enumerating an exhaustive list would take all day, you know. But I, I suppose if I were if I were just going to mention a handful, um, as, as I think particularly relevant for academic life and, and, and especially for academic life today, um, I think I would point to uh, a set of virtues. I, I would call them the virtues of truth, virtues of, of 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 truthfulness. There are virtues that sort of cluster around the good the good of truth, you know, which is really what the university exists for. It exists to orient students. To, to truth and to the pursuit of truth. Uh, and so these are virtues like, um, well, honesty, you know, it's a very, it's a very important virtue of truth. Uh, and it's a, it's a virtue, it seems there's a, there's a great deal of, of empirical evidence that uh, it's a virtue that's sorely lacking in, in, in large majorities of, of students on college campuses today, uh, cheating, particularly, particularly in, in the United States, but I, I would guess elsewhere, cheating is endemic. It's a huge problem for, instruct, for instructors. And, and uh, you know, thinking about ways in which we can cultivate a spirit of, 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 of honesty in our, our students is, is crucial, both for our, our immediate work as teachers, but also you know, these are the same students who are gonna go out into the world you know, and face the same temptations to to, to dishonesty, you know, in their professional lives and their in their home lives, and uh, so and there are there are other virtues like this that cluster around around truth, um, uh, virtues like intellectual humility, um, you know, are, are are tremendously important, especially in elite institutions where people tend to think of think a lot of themselves. I think uh, there's a a virtue we don't have a great name for anymore. Um, Ancient writers, ancient you know, and medieval writers described it as studiosity, studiousness. You might say today, which is the the uh, desiring the right kinds of knowledge. You know, and this is a, a tremendously this is a, a, a tremendously important capacity which we have almost no even even vocabulary for describing today, much less sort of uh, uh, concrete ways of pursuing. But the ability to 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 ask and then answer with integrity questions like, why are you studying this subject? Why do you want to, why do you want to know this stuff? You know, what are you going to, what are you going to do with it once you know it? Uh, is this the, uh, is this a question we ought to be asking? You know, uh, I mean, these are these are questions which in institutional review boards prompt researchers to ask. In extreme cases, you know, should you really be, should you really be, you know, con. Uh, Conducting electroshock experiments on small children, you know those, those sorts of questions. But I think they're they're questions that have have much broader application and salience, you know, than than just in in questions where physical harm, you know, or, or psychological trauma are in view. And uh, um, so yeah, I think that those those are the are the, the sort of cluster of virtues that I think would you know are most important really for us to uh, for those of us in the academy to sort of seek to cultivate both in ourselves and in our students.